Friends, this morning we kind of come into this moment where it's the end of of this series that we've been in now for several weeks. I believe we started at the uh, beginning of October, and so about five weeks now, and it's been such an incredible series. We've been talking through, you know, what it means to be the church. We've been kind of processing these pillars and these these uh, these things that that the Apostle Paul puts together for us to understand the Book of Ephesians. There's these different elements of uh, of what he really puts in front of us to understand what the what the church is like what is the identity of the church what does it mean to be the church all of these elements and so we've really been wrestling with quite a few things and it's been quite an incredible journey and what's awesome is especially if you've been taking notes or taking advantage of the Version bible app you've been able to save all these thoughts and save these notes um that way you can reflect and look back on them but uh well friends i'm looking forward to this morning as we process just another incredible characteristic of of who the church is and who god has called us to be and so again it's our third week of having this earlier service time and so if you need to stretch or move around or wake up some people who are next to you bump some elbows i can't wait for us to jump into this so let's make sure that our attention and our mind is on the front and ready to receive what god has for us right are are you ready give me give me an amen Are, are we ready for this morning absolutely i love it i love it i love it um, but this last week, our family, we got to celebrate something kind of exciting. Um, Mason, our son, turned three. Um, and what was really special is that I kind of had this moment of like, oh my goodness, our little boy is now three years old, right? I remember when he was just born and he was just three minutes old. And it seems like just that, he's now a little boy running around and doing crazy, chaotic little boy things. and. And I, I just have loved this adventure being a parent. And, and perhaps you've heard this. I've, I've heard it many times, especially when Aaron and I were pregnant and, you know, getting ready for Mason to show up, is that I heard really often that, that as, a, as a person who's following Christ, that when you become a dad, there's this unique perspective that kind of, um, that kind of opens up in your eyes. When you, when you begin to have this new relationship from a father to a son or even a father to a daughter, or even from a mother to their child, Right, we begin to realize just the incredible amount of love and the dynamic of, of being a child of God and having a heavenly father. This, this relationship, this way that God describes our connection with him as our heavenly father and, and as a son or as a daughter, right? And so I, I just, over the years, have, have realized, right, as being a dad myself, being able to see like, wow, the, the amount of grace and love that I have for my son. When I look at him, and now our daughter as well, right? The amount of unconditional love that is welling up inside of me. When I look at our children, I just think, wow, that my Heavenly Father looks at me in the exact same way. And then even though sometimes when Mason creates a mess or is a little chaotic and perhaps it frustrates me a little bit or even Aaron as well, that love is still there. And just that same reality that sometimes when I don't quite get it right, and that God is still there and still loves me. He's still patient with me. He still has grace for me. And so some of those incredible things. And, and so parenthood is typically one milestone that we talk about how it opens up this reality of who God is and, and, and how it is for us as we are a child of his. But there's this mother, another milestone that we often get to experience in life that we don't quite talk about as much. There's another milestone that that many of us, some of us, we get to you know, embrace at some point in our life, doesn't matter what our story may be, but it's something that happens that really actually opens up a great perspective of who God is and in our relationship with Him, but it's something that we don't quite talk about, I think for many reasons, perhaps it's because we've never quite really understood it. It's something perhaps that we've heard, but it's never quite made sense. And so I hear people talk about it, and it's kind of odd, but it doesn't really mean much to us. This morning, as we come into the end of this series, and we come into this last characteristic, this defining pillar of the church in Ephesians 5, I want us to wrestle with this beautiful relationship dynamic that Jesus tells that exists between us and him. And so we're going to read Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 32, and if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it out in front of you and 
Um, if you want to follow along the screen, you can do that as well. Or if you have the YouVersion Bible app, or if you're even watching online, you can pull up the YouVersion app real quick on your phone and follow along, because it may perhaps be hard to read the screen. But, but Ephesians 5, 22 to 32 says this. Let's read it together. It says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Lean into this. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands and everything. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Listen, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Here in this moment in Ephesians 5, and even in other parts of Scripture, we hear about how there's this unique dynamic between Christ and the church because the, the church is the, the bride of Christ. Right? Which, which, which sounds kind of funny when we hear it and when we talk about it. Right, even though what we read there is a part of, of what the Apostle Paul is teaching about this element of, of, of Christian household and relationships. And if you were to continue to read chapter 5 and into chapter 6, you'd read about families and children and, and co-workers and different dynamics of human interaction. But, but here at the beginning of all of it, he unpacks this, this reality that the church is much like a relationship between a husband and a wife. Because, because the church is the bride of Christ. And like I keep saying, that, that sounds funny to us. We, we've heard it. We've heard it echoed around us, but it doesn't quite resonate with anything in here because it doesn't really quite mean much. It doesn't make sense, right? Especially for those of us who are guys, right? We think, I'm not, I'm not a woman. I'm not, I'm not wearing some dress. What do you mean I'm the bride of Christ? What is this dynamic? Like, what are you talking about? Right, but, but genders and sexuality, all these things have nothing to do with this kind of this uh, metaphor, this relationship between Christ and the church. But there's this great, powerful significance that we've been missing. We've been missing for a long time. What it means to be the bride of Christ. And this may sound a little crazy, but my hope, church, my hope is that when we come to the close of our time this morning, that we leave this place with a new spring in our step as we think of this reality of like, man, I'm, a, I'm part of the bride of Christ, man. I mean, it may ask me that we, you know, perhaps get tattooed on our, our body or something we write on our mirror, but, but this, this new well of love, this new well of excitement, this reality of, wow, I am a part of the bride of Christ. Because there truly is some great significance in this relationship, in this dynamic, because there's purpose, right? God doesn't use a metaphor by accident. He doesn't use something just sad to kind of get people to begin to understand. No, he, he used something for a great purpose. And there's tremendous purpose in this metaphor. You see, I remember it was quite a few years ago, the day that Aaron and I got married. Here's actually a picture of us on our wedding day, right? Young and crazy and madly in love. I remember we had been engaged for just six months. And I remember that day, this is one of those pictures, right, where you, you take it before the ceremony, right? So it was one of those, like, no-look kind of pictures, so I had no idea what she had looked like. I could just feel her dress behind me and her hair and her hands, right? But I remember that day, right, seeing her in her glory and her beauty, just seeing her come down the, the aisle, and as everybody stands, I just remember looking at her like, wow, she is gorgeous, right? She's beautiful. Look at her smile and her, 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 her jewelry and her hair and her dress was just 
gorgeous. And, and then now, here we are, years later, I look at my pictures and I'm like, man, Andre, why didn't you get a haircut? Right? Come on! Your wife looks amazing! What do you, you could even go pay for a $15 haircut? Like, how broke were you, dude? Ah, <sighs> and if you were to see other pictures of our wedding, I rented a super cheap suit and I looked like a walking baby elephant, okay? Because <laughs> it didn't fit me right. Ah, <sighs> but I remember that day of seeing my wife come down the aisle and standing, right? And, and, and Aaron's dad is a pastor and so he was the one who officiated our wedding and I remember just standing there looking down at her smiling. And I remember I had this moment where I was like, pinch me. Like, is this real? Have you ever had that happen? Like, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen. And you're like, is this, is this real? Right, pinch me. I remember standing there and just seeing her beautiful. And I remember beginning to have a tear roll down my eye and uh, down my cheek. And I remember, you know, hearing this encouraging message from my father-in-law about, you know, loving each other and, you know, you know, loving his daughter and her loving me as we embrace this, this uh, journey of marriage. And I remember walking through the vows of I do's and I remember walking through the declarations of I do's and the vows of repeat after me and all these things. And I remember we get to this moment in the ceremony that I'll never forget. And it was the exchange of the rings. And I remember that moment out of the entire ceremony the most because there is something extremely unique that my father-in-law shared. There's something he said after I put the ring on her finger and she put my ring on mine that has stuck with me every single day. Would you like to know what it was? You see, I was able to dig through all of our files and all of our, all of our archive things and I found just a clip of our wedding video and it's only two minutes long, we're going to watch it here in a second, so try not to cry with me, all right? <laughs> but later on, you'll notice that there is a child who, you know, the last 30 seconds of the clip cries with great emotion. And so if you hear a child crying, it's the video, not in there. <laughs> uh, but there's something I want you all to hear that happened that day. Can we watch this video, Bethany? Would you mind hitting play? For the first couple of seconds, there's no audio until... My father-in-law begins to talk. Aubrey, as you put the ring on Aaron's finger, repeat after me. With this ring, I be wed, and all my worldly goods, I be endowed, in token and pledge of my constant faith, and abiding love. Okay. As you put the ring on that wrist finger, repeat after me. With this ring, I be wed, and all my worldly goods, I be endowed, in token and pledge, of my constant faith and abiding love. To take a look at those rings. No matter where you go on the face of this earth, you have a reminder. Every time you look down at that ring, you have a reminder that there is somebody out there that loves you with a deep and amazing love. And not only that, so much so that they have vowed to you to spend the rest of their, day, their, their days with you. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Those are awesome reminders. And I want to encourage you to, to hold on to those rings as a, the sign of your love for each other. To always be able to look down at this ring and remember the vows that we've made, the commitments, that I'm going to love you, only you, that I'm not going to love anybody else, Aaron, but I'm only ever going to love you. Vows that all that I have, every 
bit of student loan debt and every terrible car that I drive and everything that we have there is broke college students is yours. And I'm going to walk with you in the greatest seasons of our life and I will walk with you in the lowest seasons of our life. We make those vows with each other. We all do when we get married. But this reality that we get to look down at our hand and look at our ring and remember not that we made those vows to them, but somebody made those vows to us. That all of who they are and all of what they have is ours as well. That I could fly anywhere in the world and I still have a girl back home who's crazy about me. That I am somebody's first love and that their heart belongs to me. You see this reality that in our relationship as a church, I mean the bride of Christ, is that we are Jesus' first love and that his heart belongs to us. Like let that sink in. The reality that we are Christ's first, first love as the bride. And that his heart, you know, it belongs to us. In this reality of all of who God is, he's promised to us. Is that as people in this relationship with him, we have the ability to bring our worries and bring our brokenness and bring ourselves to him and ask for his help and ask for his leadership and ask for his wisdom, ask for his power. When we go to him, we can pray, we can seek his face and know that he's gonna listen to us, know that he is with us and know that he cares for us. This reality that we as a church are his first love you see and even through this text as we as we read through the sections of Ephesians there are these characteristics that float to the surface that that explain the beauty of this dynamic I mean the beginning where Paul talked about how how he is the head of the body and he is the Savior and he is the one who, who leads the body of Christ this reality is that as people who are his first love, as his people, he is so eager to lead us that we don't have to necessarily try to fix up our life or try to get all of our ducks in a row or try to make ourselves look good, that he is eager to lead us and call us forward. He is eager to help us guide our steps. He's eager, right, to, to be the one who, who radically saves our soul. He's wanting to lead us. And even as Paul here in Ephesians continued to talk, he talked through that beautiful reality of how, how Christ gave himself up for us, the church, his bride, so that way we can be cleansed and be made holy and be made new by the washing of the word, be made holy and blameless. And in this deep reality that, that Jesus isn't just wanting to leave us where we are, but he's wanting to, to be involved in our life. And he's not wanting us to feel trapped in sin and trapped in our behaviors and trapped with, with things in our hearts that are leading us in an unhealthy way. Things in us that we wish we could change, but we just can't. Jesus says, I, I love you. And I want to do a work in you. I want, to, I want to change you. I want to help you grow into who you are meant to be. This beautiful reality that comes out of being the bride of Christ, right? I mean, how incredible is this that the creator of the universe 
calls us his first love and says, listen, I want to help you climb out of the pit you're in. I, I want to help you kind of shake the dust off. I want to smooth off the rough edges. I want to help you grow. I want to help you live with his joy and well-being inside of you. I want to help lead you on the right path. It's an incredible reality. And even as Paul continues to talk there in Ephesians, he says, even towards the end, he, he talks about how we care for our own body, how we feed and nurture and, and take care of our bodies the same way that Christ does the church. And this beautiful reality, this beautiful reality is that, that God deeply cares about our well-being, that the pain that we carry, the struggles we face, the identity we're trying to build, the security we're trying to find. He's wanting to be our source. He's wanting to sustain us. He's wanting to nourish our souls. He's wanting to fill that aching. He's wanting to satisfy that desire for fulfillment. He's wanting to take care of us. He's wanting to give us strength. He's wanting to do all of these deep things within us. It's incredible. All because as people who are his church and a part of his family, we're his bride. All because of that. We don't have to have life all figured out and pretend like we know what we're doing or to fill even our own up impossible expectations of being good enough is that he loves us as he finds us and he wants to help us get off, off of our feet and clean us off and walk us forward and help us when we stumble and he wants to help us build our identity and our understanding of life and all of these things on him because he's the creator of the universe. All because we're his bride and we're his first love. But you see, friends, there's a question that we need to ask ourselves. There's a question that could very easily go unasked. We could end our time right there, feel excited, feel, woo, right? We're the bride of Christ. Or we could leave out of this place. But there's a question we need to ask ourselves as we wrestle with this reality that, that we, as the church, are Jesus' first love. We must ask ourselves this. Is he even our first love? As Christ's heart belongs to us, does our heart even belong to him? Because perhaps that's why we've been missing this beautiful dynamic of being the bride of Christ. And we've been missing out on what God is looking to do. And I, I deeply believe that, that Paul drives and, and builds up these three different characteristics of Christ being the head and wanting to cleanse us and wanting to care for us. I believe he builds up these three uh, kind of pillars of, of this characteristic of being the bride of Christ because these tend to be our three biggest downfalls, our three biggest pitfalls that hinder our pursuit of Christ. You see, because we have a deep problem, a deep problem with submitting to Christ as our head. We have an issue with submission, is that we as individuals and even us collectively have an issue and a problem and a, and a hard time truly submitting ourselves to Christ as, as the one who's trying to lead us. Because so often we simply bring ourselves to God and we say, all right, God, you know, help me. You know, would you lead me? We come to him in a time of crisis when we are afraid of finances or afraid of our marriage or afraid for our kids or whatever the hardship could be. We bring ourselves to him in crisis mode and we say, God, would you lead me? God, would you take care of me? And we see him begin to do this work. But then when we feel good and we feel like we've 
gotten taken care of. Then we're like, all right, God, you know, I'm going to keep going to church, but I'm just going to kind of do my thing. Is that all right? I'm going to come once a week, give you an hour. But, but God, now I'm, I'm feeling good. Life is better, right? We're not fighting as much. Life is good. I'm going to just go about ways and things that I just want to do. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to live. And I'm going to come and smile and look good. But Lord, I'm just going to do me. We have a hard time really submitting. We say, you know, God, I, life is just chaotic right now with the kids. You know, I'll, I'll get serious in a couple of years when things are less chaotic. Or, you know, right now life is just tough. Life is just hard. Maybe, maybe later on I'll start to get serious and really be serious about following you, Jesus. Or, or perhaps right now we're enjoying life, right? We're getting retired or, or perhaps we're, you know, the kids have left the house, Woo! right? We're just getting married. Life is great, fun. I'm like, Jesus, you know, don't worry, I still love you, but, but I'm just gonna enjoy now. We have a hard time submitting sometimes. We have a hard time bringing ourselves in and, say, and saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And, and what you tell me to do, I'm going to do. We often go to God looking for direction, and we usually only listen for what we want to hear. Because when God leads us or gives us an idea, or we have a friend who speaks an idea to us or what it could be, however God chooses to speak to us, when we have some sense of direction for God's will put in front of us, and we, mm, we don't quite like it, then we're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just, we're just going to keep asking, we're going to keep waiting, we're going to keep waiting until God uh, puts great confidence in this result. We're going to keep waiting until it's something that I feel comfortable with. We have a hard time submitting. We have a hard time individually submitting and collectively submitting to God. Because as human beings, we often come together and even as people who are following Jesus and even as people who are, are wanting to know God more, we're still imperfect. And sometimes we bring some of our unhealthy mindsets and behaviors together into the group. And, and, and one in particular is that we bring even a sense of pride that can lead to division. And not just in, within one local body, but within the global church. Globally, we have a hard time with submitting because pride. We want to be better than somebody else. We tend to compete. Or we just want to stick with those who are like us. We don't want to hear the hardships of those who are different, especially if they're blaming us for their hardship. We have a hard time submitting to Christ. And as bride, we have a really hard time listening to his leadership. Because we feel like we know what is best. One of the big problems we face as the bride of Christ, why we tend to miss out so much of this beautiful dynamic, this beautiful relationship that we have, is because we can't submit. We can't submit to him. And that's not all, is that even with that second pillar of how Christ is wanting to clean us up and make us holy and blameless, we have a huge problem with stubbornness. Because we'll come to Christ, we'll say, Jesus, would you save me? Jesus, would you help me? I've realized that I've sinned. God, would you forgive me? We pray this prayer. We raise a hand. We, 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 we kneel down, whatever kind of moment it may be. But we had this moment of surrender. But then when God is when continuing, you know, that, that process of molding us and shaping us and changing us, we tend to be a little stubborn. We tend to be a little resistant to his conviction. And so both as individuals and as collective body, we tend to resist change and we tend to resist God's conviction and that will ruin us. That is why when we begin this time every Sunday, I pray for God to convict us. 
Because we want to be people who hear, hear God's voice, don't we, church? We want to hear God's voice. We want to hear the creator of the universe speak to us. And he loves speaking to us with joy. He loves speaking to us with grace. He loves speaking to us in all of these ways with encouragement, uplifting ways. Then there are seasons where he will speak conviction to us. And we'll say, no, no, God, I, I, I love the good stuff, but, 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 you know, you're telling me that these habits I have are wrong. Ah, I, I don't like that. You know, can you, can you keep that conviction away? We don't like that tension, right? Especially in our Western culture, we don't like feeling uncomfortable. And so we're like, God, you know, that, that tension, right? I, I get it, but I'm not ready for that. Would you just, can you just tell that to somebody else? Or would you tell, would you tell him that, right? He's the one that needs to change. Or, or she's the one that needs to get better, right? So God, can you, can you just convict them about it, but not me. I'm happy. I'm content. I want to stay where I'm at. And, and what happens is that when we experience this conviction, when we see, hear the creator of the universe speaking to our soul and, and bringing this tension of, 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 of change into our humanity, into our very being, what happens is we just kind of close our ears and say, God, no, 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 I don't want to listen. And then when it goes away, we get upset because we can't hear God talking to us anymore. I hear it all the time. Pastor, I feel like I'm not being fed at church anymore. That's because you closed your ears. Because God was convicting you and speaking to you. And we all love the good stuff. We love the joy. We love the fulfillment. The, the the purpose that he brings into our being, but the tension is something we can't ignore. And if we ignore it, our heart will grow cold and we'll come to church and everyone else will hear the Holy Spirit speaking to them, but you. When you come into a moment of prayer, you come into a moment of reading scripture. You come into a moment of singing your favorite worship song in the car, driving down the road. You don't care who's looking, but you're singing at the top of your lungs. And you probably sound terrible, but probably not as bad as me. But yet you're singing and you don't feel like God's with you in the car like he has been. We're stubborn. Or we serve. We serve and we serve. We serve, whether it's on Sunday morning, we serve in outreach things, we serve in groups, we serve each other, whatever the dynamic could look like. But that serve turns into work and it turns into exhaustion when we kind of seal off our hearts from God's voice and his leadership. Because God is trying to lead us, he's trying to change us, he's trying to make us holy, he's trying to make us pure, he's trying to clean us out all the junk that isn't there that shouldn't be there all the the junk that that he didn't make us to have we're being stubborn and letting go of and so we have a really big problem with being stubborn and listening to god's voice individually and even collectively and then even that last element of how christ takes care of his body we have a problem with setting aside our past loves. As Jesus talks about a husband and wife coming together and, and you know, leaving their parents and the two becoming one, this mystery that he's talking about is the church, this reality that we come to him setting aside our past loves and only loving him is a problem that we had. You see, it was a long time when Aaron and I started dating. We were in high school, we were young, and uh, of course right now in the life that we're all in, we see on Facebook how people are posting pictures of like them when they first started dating and then pictures of now and the change, right? And so naturally I wanted to share another picture with you all, this picture of Aaron and I when we started dating, right? That summer, I remember I had uh, bleached my hair for some reason. I don't know what I was thinking, right? When you're young, you just make really dumb decisions. <laughs> And also, too, didn't know how to go get a haircut. But I remember we were young, and we actually were getting ready to go out to a dance together. Erin had a, a dance at her school, into separate high schools. And I remember we had only been dating maybe for a month or two at the time. And, and we took this picture. We are going to this dance. And I remember, I remember being there at this dance. 
I remember out of the corner of my eyes, we were there that night and we were dancing with the music and having a great time, all that, that, you know, the high school stuff. And I remember, I remember out of the corner of my eyes, saw a guy who Aaron used to like and he used to like her. I remember I saw him. And I remember this, this instinct kind of kicked in within me. And all of a sudden I started to stand a little bit taller. And, and my chest was a little bit bigger. My muscles were a little out like this. And I remember all of a sudden my voice got deeper. Right, all of a sudden, right, and I, I had this, guys were weird, right, we just, we want to like protect what's ours, like, oh no, just girl, 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 mine, mine, not yours, stay away, right, we're crazy, we get, we get jealous so easily as us guys, we want to be defensive and protect what's ours, and, and I remember that moment just, you know, all of a sudden just changing, Aaron's like, what are you doing, what, like, stop, you're being weird, like, what's going on, but I remember, ah, <sighs> Just being jealous and having this odd feeling that I need to protect what was mine. You see, friends, we have a very jealous God. We have a very, very jealous God. And not that Aaron was glancing across the room and looking at this guy that she used to like. No, her eyes were fixated on me and my very ugly blonde hair. But God sees how we glance at our old life. He sees how we turn around and we, we look. Ah, I used to have so much fun. I used to, I used to love partying. I used to love doing those things. I, I still love doing it. And I, I, I love getting to do all these things. I love, I love these habits. I love that habit. I love getting to go do this. And some things, some of this stuff, God's fine with. He's, he's not upset about But there are things that we love too much that he does not want us to love. And he's frankly jealous. And we have a really hard time setting aside our past loves. That way we can love Jesus with all of who we are. We have a hard time to cutting the ties of the life we used to live. We have a hard time letting go. Because we're afraid we won't have fun. We're afraid we won't feel secure. We're afraid that we'll feel uncomfortable. We'll, we're afraid that following Jesus won't be worth it. Just as a husband, as, as a man leaves his mother and father to join his bride, Christ left heaven that way we could join him. But we're having a hard time leaving behind what we used to know. We're having a hard time being all in with this new relationship. And so I, I don't know what your story is. I don't know where you are with God. But perhaps a shift that you could make that probably we all need to make. is that we need to have the shift in our heart for him to be our one true love. For him to be the one that gives us our security, for him to be the one that gives us our identity, for him to be the one who gives us our purpose and our fulfillment and all of these things, for him to be the one who leads us. Maybe we can continue to go about life. We continue to go about life as individuals and we collectively just kind of checking off church and playing the church game and, and looking like we're good religious people and all these things. We continue to, to live that way the rest of our days. But we're going to miss out on a lot of what God is looking to do now. If we're unwilling to take this step and say, you know what, Jesus, your heart belongs all to me and I see it. My heart is completely yours. Jesus, you look at me and, and I'm your first love that you love me in that way. I love you back. You're my first love. And so church this morning, perhaps in our journey of being the bride of Christ, we need to start loving him before anything else, before any 
be any, any habits we have, any other things perhaps that are going on in our life that we properly love a little too much. We need to love him first. For many of us, if we grew up in church, we grew up knowing about God, having a respect for God, right? Loving God, right? We heard those terms. We grew up always believing in God, but this concept of being all in for Jesus, it's new. This idea of, of really giving my heart to him is new. It's something I, I never heard my pastor as a kid say. It's something my parents never talked to me about. Listen, Jesus is wanting a meaningful relationship with each of us individually. Oh, it's a privilege to love him back and have this tangible, deep, and substantial connection with the God of the universe who made us, who put us here not to do a nine to five, but put us here on purpose, put us here with, with great intent to do something meaningful with our life. To have a relationship with the creator of the universe. I don't know about you, but many mornings as I'm walking in to go jump on a school bus, it's five o'clock in the morning and I'm looking up at the stars. And I am in awe because I think, wow, the one who made those. He made me and he loves me more than that beautiful bright star shining across the galaxy and he loves me that way and so friends in a moment we're gonna sing that song we sang earlier again that song as you find me we're gonna sing those lyrics of of God as you find me you love me, I'm yours, I'm in. Father, my, my heart is yours. We're gonna be singing those lyrics again. And I, I want us to worship. I want us to have a posture of, of submission. I want us to have a heart that has resolved its stubbornness and is eager for Christ to change us. I, I want us to finally set aside the past, set aside the things we've been holding on to for too long, the things that we've been loving more than him, and say, Jesus, you love me as you find me, and I love you too. I'm undeserving of this love, but yet you love me anyway. Jesus, I'm in and I am yours. Friends, may we stand together. And I want us to pray in a unique way. May we put our arms out like this together. This is a posture of submission. This is a posture of ready to receive. I want us to pray this way and I want us to worship. Let's pray. Father, we are here for you. Lord, please speak to us. Please lead us forward. Please do a deep, meaningful work in us. God, you are holy. Father, you are perfect. You are beyond us. Father, you are greater than us, but yet you love us. You made us for a purpose. So, Father, we here today are reclaiming our identity as your bride. We're reclaiming this gift from you to be in such an incredible relationship. So, Father, fill our hearts, lead our minds. We need you. Father, we need you. Jesus, have this time as we worship. 
have us. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? We pray this in your holy and amazing name. Amen.